everyone. So today we are here with a topic from the subject of general pathology and the topic is shock. So in today's session we will be going through the definition, types, classification and pathogenesis of shock. The various stages of shock will be covered in detail in another session. So let's start. We will start with the definition first. Okay. So shock is a life-threatening clinical syndrome of cardiovascular collapse. Okay, it's a life-threatening clinical syndrome of cardiovascular collapse. It's mainly concerning with your CVS, okay? Cardiovascular collapse and it is characterized by mainly two things. One is there is an acute reduction of effective circulating blood volume, okay? There is a reduction in the effective circulating blood volume because of which you have hypotension and so automatically when your circulating blood volume is less there will be an inadequate perfusion of your cells and tissues also which is called as your hypoperfusion. So in the definition you basically have to remember three key terms. One is it's a cardiovascular collapse so CVS then you have to remember hypotension and you have to also remember hypoperfusion. Okay so that is your definition. Now coming to the types of shock. The first type of shock is actually initial or primary shock. Now what do you mean by initial or primary shock? It's a transient shock. Okay, It's a transient shock that is usually a benign vasovagal attack due to sudden reduction. There is a sudden reduction of venous return to the heart which is caused by neurogenic vasodilation and consequent peripheral pooling of the blood. Okay, So initial or primary shock is something that happens for a small span of time. Example is immediately, immediately following a trauma. Okay, suppose you have an RTA or something. So immediately following a trauma, you can see initial or primary shock or it can be after something like some severe pain or you have some emotional overreactions like fear or sorrow or surprise. Okay, so anything that you see for that short span of time is what is called as initial or primary shock. So clinically, the patient will be suffering from attacks lasting for a few seconds because it's transient, right? So few seconds or minutes. That's it. And they'll develop brief, okay, they'll develop brief period of unconsciousness, weakness, sinking sensations, etc. So they'll have pale and clammy limbs, very weak and rapid pulse and of course they'll have a low BP, okay, that is there'll be hypotension. So that is initial or primary shock. Whereas you have true or secondary shock, okay, true or secondary shock is actually a circulatory imbalance between your oxygen supply and the oxygen requirement that is your body requires more oxygen but your supply of oxygen is just not able to maintain that okay they are not able to meet the requirements so when that imbalance comes in play between the oxygen supply and oxygen requirement at the cellular level you call it as your circulatory shock or that is the true shock which is also called a secondary shock. So it is basically this shock that is true or secondary shock which is commonly referred to as shock. If nothing is specified, if they simply say shock, they are actually referring to your true or secondary shock. Okay. So you can remember something like PITS. Okay. P-I-T-S. Just to remember that P-I that is initial or primary shock and the second one is true or secondary shock. Okay. Now coming to the classification of shock. Okay, it's basically an etiologic classification. So there are four kinds of shock. We can say one is hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, septic shock and others. So these are how shock is being classified. Okay, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, septic and others. And this cardiogenic can be further divided into three types. It can be because of deficient emptying or it can be because of deficient filling or it can be because of some kind of obstruction. Okay, So for you to remember these uh, four kinds of shock actually it can be seen from the spelling itself. Okay, If you consider this as shock K is missing. So S is for septic, H is for hypovolemic, C is for cardiogenic and O is for others. Okay, And uh, for you to remember the three types of cardiogenic shock, Okay, the three kinds of cardiogenic shock you can remember it as four okay f o e four everybody knows right four means enemy okay so f is for uh, deficient filling 
O is because of obstruction and E is because of deficient emptying. So you can remember something like your enemy had a heart attack or something like that. Okay, just for you to remember. Okay, so now let's get into each type of shock in detail. Okay, so the first is your hypovolemic shock. So hypovolemic shock, the name itself shows, right? Hypo means less, volemia means volume. So there is a reduced volume of blood. So it can be because of acute hemorrhage. Okay, if you have bleeding. Okay, if you have bleeding, then there is a loss of blood and it can lead to hypovolemic shock. Or it can be because of dehydration. Dehydration can be either from vomiting, severe vomiting, severe diarrhea and all. You can have dehydration. So that will also lead to hypovolemic shock. Or you can have burns. Burns also can lead to hypovolemic shock. There is a loss of fluid, lots of fluid, right? Then it can be because of excessive use of diuretics. You know, everybody knows what are diuretics, right? Those are the drugs that we give to increase the urinary output. So if you use that in excessive amount, what happens? There's an increased amount of loss of fluid. So that will also lead to hypovolemic shock. And it can also be because of acute pancreatitis. Okay. So for you to remember the reasons of hypovolemic shock, you can remember something like bed and pH. Okay. So B is for burns, E is for excessive use of diuretics, D is for dehydration, P is for pancreatitis and H is for hemorrhage. Okay, you can just use that clue if you want. Now coming to the second type that is cardiogenic shock. Okay, so cardiogenic shock I already told you right. There are three subheadings under cardiogenic. You can remember it as four. Okay, F O E which is deficient filling, deficient emptying and it can also be because of obstruction. Yeah, so let's see. The first one that is deficient emptying. Okay, so deficient emptying under that you have your myocardial infarction, your cardiomyopathies, rupture of heart, ventricle or papillary muscles or it can be also because of cardiac arrhythmia. Whereas deficient filling can be because of cardiac tamponade from hemopericardium. So for you to remember this, you can remember the name Mr. Cardiac or something. Imagine your enemy's name is Mr. Cardiac. So M is for myocardial infarction, R is for rupture. And with cardiac, actually you have a cardiac arrhythmia. Okay, you can also remember cardiomyopathy. You can also remember cardiac tamponade. Okay. Now coming to the third one, obstruction. Here we finished deficient emptying and deficient filling okay now one more is left that is obstruction right obstruction so obstruction we all know right it can be because of embolism or it can be because of thrombus those are the common obstructions that we know and it can also be because of tension pneumothorax and also dissecting aortic aneurysm so again if you want you can remember it as tetanus okay so that is t is for thrombus e is for embolism the T again for tension pneumothorax and this A and U you can remember it as aneurysm. So aortic aneurysm. Okay. Okay. So now moving on to the third type of shock which is septic shock. Okay. It's very very important. Septic shock. It can be either caused by a gram negative organism or a gram positive organism. If it is caused by a gram negative organism, it is called as an endotoxic shock. And if it's caused by gram positive organism, it is called as an exotoxic shock. Okay. So it's endo or exo. Mm? So here it is N, right? So you can remember it as gram negative. Okay. N is for negative. So gram negative, it is endotoxic. And then you just have to remember the names of a few organisms, gram-negative organisms like E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Bacterioids and gram-positive you can remember the names of the two cocci, okay, that is streptococci and pneumococci. Now coming to the other types of shock, okay, so other types we have traumatic shock, neurogenic shock and also you can have hypoadrenal shock. So traumatic shock can be because of some kind of severe injuries or some surgeries with marked blood loss okay or it can be some obstetrical trauma and neurogenic it can be because of high cervical spinal cord injuries or accidental high spinal anesthesias or severe head injury all that can lead to your neurogenic shock or it can be hypoadrenal shock. So hypoadrenal shock can be because of high doses of glucocorticoids or it can be because of secondary adrenal insufficiency.
okay so you can remember it as others others is o t h e r s right so t is for traumatic okay t is for traumatic h is for uh, hypoadrenal shock and this h also looks like n right so you can remember it as neurogenic shock so others are traumatic hypoadrenal and neurogenic shock okay so now let's see what is the pathogenesis of shock okay so basically all forms of shock involve the following three derangements one is there is a reduced effective circulating blood volume we discussed that in the first slide itself right that there will be a reduction in the blood volume so when the blood volume is reduced automatically the supply of oxygen to the cells and tissues are also reduced and that will lead to a condition that is called as anoxia and then what happens there are inflammatory mediators and toxins that are released from shock induced cellular injury so when all these things happen when the when there is anoxia and your cells are being damaged of course the innate immunity of your body will not sit simply it will start reacting so they will start releasing inflammatory mediators and toxins and all that so all that will finally lead to cellular injury so these derangements initially they are actually acting as a part of your compensatory mechanism they're trying to save the body but eventually what happens this will turn into a vicious cycle of cell injury cell injury will lead to cellular dysfunction and that will finally lead to a breakdown of your organ function so let's see the pathogenesis in terms of a flow chart okay so it'll be easier for you to remember see there is a decrease circulating blood volume the first thing that happens so automatically the venous return to your heart is going to be reduced so when the venous return to the heart is reduced the amount of blood that is pumped by your heart that is your cardiac output will also be reduced so when your cardiac output is reduced there will be a total reduction in the blood flow so when blood flow is reduced there is a decreased supply of oxygen that will lead to a condition that is called as anoxia when there is no much oxygen entering into your cells they will go into anoxia so when it goes into anoxia your inflammatory mediators will come into picture and they will finally induce what is called as your shock okay and when shock happens so it's like basically hypoperfusion hypoxic cell injury so your activation of innate immunity i told you right when all these things are happening in your body the immune system of our body will not sit simply they'll get activated and when they get activated they will stimulate macrophages okay your innate immunity will stimulate macrophages and your macrophages are the ones that will release inflammatory mediators okay so they release many inflammatory mediators but the main ones or the important ones are your tnf alpha tumor necrosis factor alpha and your interleukin 1 okay these two are the very important ones so why tnf is important because tnf will release nitric oxide okay tnf will release nitric oxide and that will lead to the generation of free radicals okay so you can remember tnf right so n is for nitric oxide and that will lead to the uh, release of free radicals that is f for free radicals and then you have interleukin 1 that will lead to vasodilation vasodilation will lead to hypotension and the others are you have other cytokines like interleukin 6 12 8 and paf and also free radicals okay that will lead to an increase in your c3a and c5a okay so that was the general pathogenesis of any kind of shock now we are getting into some specific details of the pathogenesis of each type of shock okay so let's start with hypovolemic shock so it occurs from inadequate circulating blood volume hypovolemia okay so that is inadequate blood volume so the severity of clinical features will actually depend upon the degree of blood that is lost okay the degree of blood volume that is lost so depending upon how much amount of blood is lost this shock can be divided into four types okay that is it can be the compensated mild moderate or severe depending upon the amount of blood that is lost if less than 1000 ml of blood is lost it's compensated if it's between 1000 and 1500 it is called as mild if it's between 1500 to 2000 it's called as moderate and if it's greater than 2000 ml it is called as a severe shock so the clinical features the patient will be presenting to you with increased heart rate tachycardia because uh, the heart is trying to somehow compensate okay so it will pump very fast so there's an increased heart rate or tachycardia 
but there is a low BP. Okay, there's less BP, so there's hypotension. There's low urinary output. Okay, initially it is oliguria. That means reduced amount of urine output. Finally, it will lead to anuria. That is like zero urinary output. There's no urinary output at all. And then there will be an alteration in the mental state. It will be agitated to confuse to lethargic. Now moving on to the pathogenesis of cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock is basically because of severe left ventricular dysfunction. Okay, So there is a decreased cardiac output. When there is a decreased cardiac output, there is definitely decreased tissue perfusion. So there is a movement of the fluid from pulmonary vascular space to the pulmonary interstitial space. So you call that as pulmonary interstitial pulmonary edema. And then from there the fluid will move to the alveolar spaces. So you call it as alveolar pulmonary edema. So the fluid is moving from the vascular space to interstitial space to the alveolar spaces. Okay. Okay, so now moving on to the pathogenesis of septic shock. This is very important. It can be separately asked. I told you, right, it can be either because of a gram-negative or a gram-positive organism, but mainly it's because of your gram-negative organism. So when this gram-negative organism enters into your body, your immune system will be activated and there is a severe systemic inflammatory response that follows. So how is it taking place? First, there is an activation of your macrophage and your monocytes as these gram-negative organisms are entering into your body, your immune system will activate your macrophage and monocyte. But how do they activate it? It's important, okay? First, when there is a lysis of this gram-negative bacteria, endotoxins are coming. You know, right? If it's gram-negative, it is endotoxins. So, endotoxins are nothing but a lipopolysaccharide, okay? So, we'll call them LPS for our convenience, okay? Lipopolysaccharides, that is LPS. This LPS will then go and bind to something that is called as lipopolysaccharide binding protein, okay? Lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which is denoted as LBP. Now, this LPS and LBP will now form a complex, okay? So, this LPS-LBP complex will then go and bind to your CD14 molecules that is present on the surface of your monocyte or macrophage. So, then what will happen? Your monocyte or macrophage will now get uh, activated and they will stimulate many cytokines. But I told you the important ones are your TNF-alpha and your interleukin-1. Okay, so this is just to... Make it easier for you. See, imagine this is a gram-negative bacteria. So, he enters into your body and this is lysed. So, who comes out? Endotoxin comes out. Endotoxin is nothing but lipopolysaccharide or LPS. That will go and bind to your lipopolysaccharide binding protein. And they will form this complex, okay? LPS-LBP complex. That will go and bind themselves to the CD14. CD14 is present where? On your monocyte okay on your monocyte cd14 is so cd14 is present and it will go and bind or attach itself and then what happens macrophages or your monocytes will release tnf alpha and interleukin 1 so the effects of these cytokines are they'll alter your endothelial cell adhesiveness and they will promote nitric oxide synthase okay and also there is simultaneously activation of other inflammatory responses like there's an activation of your complement pathway basically it's c3a and c5a then there's an activation of your mast cells so when your mast cells are being uh, activated there's definitely histamine being released so there's an increase in the capillary permeability there is an activation of your coagulation system okay so there is thrombus formation then there's an activation of your kinin system that will lead to bradykinin eventually leading to vasodilation Okay, so the net result of above mechanism is there is vasodilation, okay, and there is an increased vascular permeability. So the profound peripheral vasodilation and pooling of blood will lead to hyperdynamic circulation. Okay, this is very important. It will lead to hyperdynamic circulation in septic shock. This is something that is contrast to your hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. In hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock, you do not have hyperdynamic circulation. Okay, that is only seen in your septic shock. Okay, so with that, we have come to an end of the session. Now, these are a few questions that has been asked in the previous years. Define and classify shock. Okay, we already learned the definition and classification, right? Like you can remember it from the word itself. 
okay s is for septic h is for hypovolemic o is for others and c is for cardiogenic shock and also discuss the pathogenesis we saw it in detail right pathogenesis of shock please uh, do not forget to draw all those flow charts and they have also asked pathogenesis of septic shock in separate okay so you have to focus on that part also so i've taken my reference from essential pathology for dental students fourth edition of harsh mohan if you found a video informative please do not forget to like share comment and subscribe to our channel and also please press the bell icon so that you get notified every time we upload a new video you can also follow us at dental school on instagram thank you